We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God be praised to Dr. Jason Allen, Sister Karen Allen, to the Board of Trustees, the faculty, the staff, the student body, and all of my father's children. I greet you in the name of Jesus. The 22nd chapter of Genesis, verses 1 through 14, I want to talk about the absurdity of God the absurdity of God. Hear these words from the word. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. I think that the greatest obstacle to the knowledge of the Bible is the knowledge of the Bible. What keeps us from knowing more about the Bible than we know about the Bible is what we think we know about the Bible. And therefore, when we come to a familiar passage like this, we have a tendency to put our minds on cruise control because we've heard this text. We've taught it, we've preached it, and there cannot be a facet of the diamond of this text that we have not yet seen. Well, I hope that we will crawl up into the lap of Yahweh and enter the cranium of our God, and say to him, sing it over again to me. Wonderful words of life, 
Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words. Wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. How we think about God determines how we think about everything else. How we think about money. How we think about love. How we think about power. For after all, God has made us in his own image and after his likeness. And it seems as if, though God doesn't have a figure, that we are trying to make God after our own image and after our own likeness so that we end up with a God that can be controlled, God that is familiar, a God that can be tamed, a God that is emasculated and his omnipotence has been reduced to impotence, a God that's domesticated, a God that's regular, a God that's normal. Therefore, we have, in our thinking, reconfigure this God so that he is now a God who has been robbed of his mystery. He has been demystified. His inscrutability has been unscrewed. And we have figured out the unfigurability of God, which is not even a word. <laughs> and we end up with a God that we've made ourselves. We want him to be our theological bellhop and our Christological bellboy. Ring a bell, room service, God shows up to give us what we want. Because after all, doesn't he exist for our convenience and our comfort? We want him to be our divine vending machine, put our prayer quarters in it, make our selection and expect to get what we have requested. And when it shows unavailable at this time, we protest and kick because God cannot deny our request, can he? Because we name it and claim it, don't we? Or we end up with a God that's our Christological Santa Claus. You better watch out, you better not pout. You better not cry, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. Because Jesus is our Christological Santa Claus who gives us gifts according to our good behavior. Grace is not a factor, is it? It's simply you get what you earn. And yet God is not against our effort. God is against our earning. And we don't earn anything from God. We get from God merely by his lavish hand of grace. God has, um, has to be thought of in our thinking as ab being absurd, being far-fetched, being redemptively ridiculous, being someone that doesn't fit our mold. And he told us that. He says in Psalm, he says in Isaiah, rather, 55, verses 8 and 9, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. He brings us to the edge of absurdity so that we see how puny we are and how exalted he is. He says in Psalm 50, verse 12, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Paul says in Romans eleven thirty three gives us a glimpse, not a gaze, not a glance, but a glimpse, all the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are past finding out they cannot be traced. He takes us to the first scenario in verse 34, Romans 11. He says, who has known the mind of God or who has been his counselor? Do you know anyone that God has chosen to lay down on his or hers plastic sofa to receive counsel, to receive advice, to receive 
a kind of leading because God knows that there is a lapse in his wisdom. He says, who has loaned anything to God that causes God to be a debtor and God has to pay? No matter how rich the person is, a trillionaire times a trillionaire, who does God owe anything to? In fact, all of us are debtors to God, even the very breath that we breathe. Psalm 150, verse 6, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. In fact, why don't you do this? Just blow on your hand. If you don't feel anything, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> there are mortuaries that ought to have your body. But if you feel something, you owe it to God to praise God. I don't know any manufacturer. I don't know any company that makes this. God has given you breath. And therefore, all my life, God has been faithful. All my life, God has been so, so good. With every breath that I'm able, I will sing of the goodness of the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, he says, it has pleased God by the foolishness of preaching, not foolish preaching, but the foolishness of preaching to save the world. And you all are sitting here right now and what you believe is, to the world, utterly ridiculous. You believe that God was seen coming down the staircase of heaven with a baby under his arm. And that Jesus caught the paint train of nature and rode it for nine long months and got off at a little place called Bethlehem. And everything he had was borrowed. A borrowed manger he was laid in. A borrowed stable to be born in. A borrowed donkey to ride to the Palm Sunday celebration in. I borrowed up a room to celebrate the Last Supper in. I borrowed cross to die on. I borrowed tomb to be put in. But he's honest. He borrowed the tomb on Friday, but Sunday morning he gave it back <laughs> with all power in his hand. And you believe that. And you believe that he's coming back again and even though you're body is scattered all over the world, he's going to put it back together again so that you have a glorified body and will rise again and that body will not be subject to sickness nor death. That's foolishness to the world. It's reality to those of us who believe. We need, just, I'm in the suburbs now, I'm coming downtown to Genesis 22, but I'm in the suburbs now. We need, we need an expanded view of God. We really do. And it can't be too expanded. We need an Isaiah revisitation. In the year Isaiah 6, a king that you, King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. How did I see him? How I lifted up his train filled the temple. The hem of his robe filled the temple. And I saw angelic beings, seraphim. They had two wings to cover their feet face because of his holiness, even though they have never left their holy and righteous estate. Two wings to cover their feet and two wings to fly away. And they said antiphonally, antiphonally to one another, this said to this and this said to this. And they were economical in the use of their words. They said nothing about immutability and sui generis, the unique God. They said nothing about omnipresence or omnipotence. They said nothing about the infinite. They said, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. In fact, they said it so loud that something happened. It's almost as if you are seraphim and you are seraphim. And you say to this side, holy, holy, holy. I wonder if you can say that. Holy, holy, holy. Say it. And you said, holy, holy, holy. And you said, holy, holy, holy. And you said, holy, holy, holy. And they said it loud. And they said it louder. And you say that's emotionalism. They are talking about God. And therefore, when the presence of God with all of his glory was there, the Bible says the doorpost shook. The inanimate object moved, responded. And here we are. We've been redeemed. We've been justified. We have been sanctified. There ought to be a response to God. There ought to be some movement. 
Oh, you don't want to be a fanatic, but it's easier to cool off a fanatic than to warm up a corpse. There ought to be some response to God. Because in heaven, we will be singing praises to him. When we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. He looked up but then saw God. He looked inside of himself and saw himself. Woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips because my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And then God had one of the seraphims to take a tongue and lift up a live coal, hot, purge his lips, atone for his sin. And now he looks outward. And God asks, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And he responded, here, my Lord, send me. We need an expanded perspective of God. And this is what's going to happen to Abraham. Abraham, like Robert Smith, is sailing uncharted waters and traveling under sealed orders. He's left here the Chaldees. He's received the promise of God that through his seed, all people will be blessed. And that's fulfilled in Revelation 5, 9, and 7 and 9, where every tribe, nation, kindred, and tongue will be a part, those believers will be a part of the kingdom of God. Now God says to him, it's an unprecedented statement, take your son, your only son, the son that you love, and offer him on one of the mountains I will show you. Take him. Take and put the instrument in his heart so that blood oozes out. And when he is dead, set him on fire like a holocaust. And the Bible says in verse 3 that Abraham gets ready to do that. Is this a cosmic crack? Take your son, your only son, the son you love. Is this a Jehovah joke? Is this a providential pun? How can God say this? God is against child sacrifice. And yet, God tells Abraham to do what he disallows his people from doing. You're not to be like the other nations. Take your son, kill him. Plus, isn't God canceling tomorrow? How are you going to bless the world through the seed of Isaac? When Isaac is getting ready to be killed, he has no wife, he has no children. Aren't you saying, cancel tomorrow? How is this? And the Bible says in verse 3 that Abraham gets up in the morning, cuts enough wood, gives the wood to the servants, and they put it on the donkey. And he, the servants, the donkey, and Isaac make their way from Beersheba, where Abraham lives, to the place that God will show them. And they arrive in three days in verse number four. We read this so quickly that it's bloodless. We rob Abraham of his humanity. Like everything was all right. Remember what James A. Sanders reminds us about. Biblical characters do not primarily serve us as models for morality, but rather as mirrors for identity. Mirrors for identity. When we see them, we ought to be able to see ourselves. How would you have handled that situation? If you knew you were going to be the only one standing in the firing squad, shooting a gun right into the head of your son, how would you have handled it? What would you have felt? If you had been the one to give your son a lethal injection, how would you have handled it? How would you have felt? If you were the only one who was to pull the lever to electrocute your son, what feelings would you have? In fact, when you go back and read verse 11 of chapter 21 of Genesis, it says that when God said to Abraham, take and cast out Hagar and your son Ishmael into the wilderness, the Bible says Abraham was distressed, disturbed. He was disturbed when God said evict Ishmael. How would he feel when God said kill Ishmael? We read it so quickly as if Abraham has no internal struggle. I think we ought to get to the place where we talk to God freely, since God already knows. Oh, you know, I would not ask God questions. No, we don't question the person of God, but we can ask God questions about his process. It was never a matter of not believing 
God in terms of his character. He's always holy. He's always good. Abraham's struggle is, how are you going to keep your promise when it looks like it's not going to come to pass? Have you been to Mount Moriah? It's the place where the common meets the uncommon. It's the place where feasting and fasting converge. It's the place where lamentation and laughter, for Isaac's name means laughter, collide. It's the place where misery and mercy come together. It's the place where singing and sighing collaborated. Whenever I am tempted, whenever storms arise, when songs give way to sighing, when hope within me dies, it is the place where redemption and rejection confront each other because you can't have redemption without rejection. And there Jesus on the cross in Mark 15, 34 is rejected. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm forgiven because he was forsaken. I'm accepted because he was cast out and tossed aside on Friday because God turns his back on him. But on Sunday morning, God raises him up from the dead. Have you been to Mount Moriah? It's a place where you're going to have to and I'm going to have to believe in the God of the promise when it looks like the promise of God is not going to take place. Be honest with God. You must come to the place where you understand God is not fragile. He can take your questions. He is faithful. Oh, I wouldn't say certain things to God. But Psalm 139 verse 2 says, he knows my thoughts afar off, which means before you get the thought, he has it. So you just as well as tell him what you're thinking. If you're upset with him, he can take it. If you think he has somehow misconstrued your life, he can take it. I'll give you this. He'll give you the luxury of the first word, but he always reserves the last word for himself. So Job, you're going and talk off and on from chapters 3 to 37. But in 38, God opens up and says, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundation of the world? Go to have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your trouble. He'll hear your faintest cry. He'll answer by and by. Feel a little prayer wheel turning. No little fire's burning. Just a little talk with Jesus will make it all right. And Job hears God speak to him and call him in 42 what he called him in 1 and 2. My servant Job. Don't try to be a super Christian. Just be a real Christian. And tell the Lord, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I must always remember that God permits things to happen in the life of the believer in order to promote his purpose. And I may not know what that purpose is right away. It's Soren Kierkegaard, the 19th century Danish existentialist philosopher who says life must be lived forward, but you can only understand it backwards. And sometimes years have to go by and you're dusting for fingerprints and you finally discover that only every page of your biography, they are the divine fingerprints of God. He's always been there. He's been jo like Joseph. You understand after many years what was meant in me for evil, God meant in me for good. To save must be a lie. So that Joseph will have an opportunity to reveal the dream of Pharaoh and then to have this ingenious plan for saving the Egyptians and to save his own family so that when his family comes down, Judah, the fourth son, is saved. If there was no Judah, there'd be no Boaz. If there's no Boaz, there'd be no Obed. If there was no Obed, there'd be no Jesse. If there was no Jesse, there'd be no David. If there'd no David, then historically, there'd be no Jesus. And so God is often permitting in order to promote his cause so that you look back on your life and you see what God is doing. Oh, three days have come. I'm trying to look at this clock and my eyes are not as, uh, okay, I've got nine minutes, nine minutes, nine minutes. <laughs> three days. Abraham needed three days to arrive at a conclusion. 
And the conclusion is found in Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. You say, oh, you can't go to Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. This is 2000 B.C. That's 100 B.C. But God wrote the book. That may be 40 uh, different editors, if you will. But he's the author. And he knows the end before the beginning begins. And Abraham, by faith, was willing to offer of Isaac as a sacrifice. Reasoning. That's what the text says. Reasoning that if it was necessary for Isaac to die, God could raise him up from the dead. Which really meant for Abraham, Isaac came from death. Isaac came from a dead womb. Sarah was postmenopausal. Do you know what that means? Postmenopausal. She was beyond childbearing. And God brought, her, brought him from a dead womb. If he could bring him from a dead womb, he could bring him from a dead tomb. He came from death. That was his reasoning. It was not a fact, a matter of whether you trust the wholeness of God. Mm. But can you trust the wholeness of God when you don't know the howness in which God will work, how God will do it? And Abraham, after three days, arrived at these conclusions. One, that Isaac was just as good as dead. Now, because God had to keep his promise. And I, Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. Even Isaac was befuddled and baffled. Father, I see the wood, I see the fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide, anticipating what John the Baptist would say 2,000 years later in John 1, There he is, behold, the lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. He offered Isaac up on the altar of his heart. How long has it been since you've talked with the Lord and told him your heart's hidden secret? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? How long has it been since your mind has been at ease? How long since your heart knew no burden? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you. Augustine is right. Thou hast made us for thyself and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. What Isaac do you and I need to offer up on the altar of our heart? In three days he arrived at a Christological perspective. Jesus is talking with the church bosses in John chapter 8 and they take great pride that Abraham is their daddy. And Jesus says in John 8, verse 58, before Abraham was, I am, my preexistence. And then he says in verse 56, that Abraham saw my day, rejoiced, and was glad. 2,000 years before I came, he saw my day. This is a moment of great revelation. He didn't understand it all. It was not progressive enough like we have progressive theology. But he saw a glimpse of it. He saw my day and rejoiced. And Jesus is already saying to these Pharisees, you are mad when you see me. But Abraham was glad. I don't know how Abraham could see Jesus 2,000 years before Christ comes. And Christ has been here for 2,000 years. And we miss him every Sunday. And the Bible is no longer a hymn book, an H-I-M book. It just becomes good story. But the third thing I think these three days provide for Abraham is that it gives, gives him an opportunity to worship. He says to the servant, stay here while the boy and I go up yonder, and we're going to worship, and then we're going to come back. What? I thought you were going up to sacrifice your son. I thought you were going to set him afire so that his body is reduced to ashes. Abraham says, we're going up there, but we're going to worship, and we're coming back again. He worshiped before God worked. He didn't say, I'm going to worship, and after I see the ram caught by his horns in the thicket, and God has worked, then I'm going to worship. Too much of our worship is reactionary. We worship when God has worked. We worship when God has delivered. We worship when God has healed. Some of us need to get in 
redemptive rhythm and just start worshiping God right now in anticipation of God doing what God's word said it would do. Go on and shout. Go on and give him praise. Go on and thank him for his goodness. Go on and give him glory for what he's done. Go on and bless his name before he does it. Go on and march around the Jericho walls, Joshua, seven times on the seventh day, one time for six straight days. And when you've done that, God still is not going to move until you shout. And when you shout, the walls are come down. I think we ought to start shouting in anticipation of what God is going to do. And then Abraham got to the top. Isaac is no little boy. Don't let artists give you a misconstrual of Isaac. He's born when Abraham is 100. He could have outran Abraham. He could have resisted being bound. He could have resisted being laid on the altar. But he was willing to do that, which reminds me of someone else who could have but didn't. And when he got ready to do that, God sent an angel to tell him, stop. Stop. Now I know that you fear me more than you fear anything else because you will not withhold your son, your only son, from me. And what God is really saying is, now you know what I've always known, but you needed to know it experientially. And now that you know it, and they were able to come down from the mountain, and the two servants who didn't say a word was able to see what God had done. I leave you with this. Ella Bazell was the 1986 Nobel Peace Prize winner. He survived the Holocaust. Some of his family members did not. But he says, I'm glad that I'm a Jew because my father, Abraham, did not kill his son. I want you to know I'm glad I'm a Christian because my father did kill his son. Oh, I know we'd like to soften it and say the Romans did it and the Jews did it. Uh, but how do you explain Revelation 13 and 8? That John looked behind the altar and saw a lamb as if it had been slain from the foundation of the world. And how do you explain Romans 8, 32, God who spared not his own son, but gave him up for us all, shall he not freely with him give us all things? Yes, all of those years, every year the high priest would offer up a lamb, spotless lamb, as an installment payment for our sin. And justice got tired of that. And justice wanted to be paid in full. Mercy and truth met together. Righteousness and peace kissed each other. And when Jesus died that Friday, the veil in the temple was torn, not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. And Elvina M. Hole picked up her pen of inspiration and dipped it in the ink of illumination. And she wrote, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain. He washed it right as snow, and he rose, and he's coming back again because he's a God that we don't understand, but a God who understands us and supplies every salvific need and every, the, every other need that we need. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for being the God that you are. Help us to praise you, not just for what you do, but for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.